Welcome to the roller coaster of midlife. I'm your host, Lucy Q. Life, like weather, is ever changing, full of peaks of sunshine and valleys of stormy rain. And midlife, well, that can bring its own category of storms. Yet the beauty of life, much like that of a storm, that lies in the aftermath, in the serenity that follows, in the vibrant rainbows that light up the sky. But it all comes down to how we choose to look at things. Joining us today to help us through these midlife storms is Annie Meehan, speaker, author, and visionary. Annie is more than just a beacon of wisdom. She is the compass guiding us to our inner strength and the catalyst for igniting our untapped potential. Annie's spirit radiates transformation, achievement, and inspiration kindling a spark in every life she touches. Just imagine that invigorating energy shot that you've always wanted in your morning coffee. Well, that's Annie propelling you forward on your journey of personal development. Welcome, Annie. Oh, thanks so much for having me. And I like that intro. I think, can you always introduce me? That was quite beautiful. Feel free to have it. I'll send you the notes. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for having me. It was beautiful, yeah. And I think it's not uncommon for, I think if you talk to any midlife woman, they are going to feel that they are in some way trapped in their own personal chaos, their own personal storm. Can you maybe share a little bit about yourself, your journey and the storms that have been coming up? Yeah, I love the name of your podcast, Roller Coaster Midlife. Isn't that the truth? I uh, I just turned 55 in March. And as I was embracing it, I was kind of laughing and being like, 55, isn't that when you can go live in senior living? Like, wait, like I think I'm 28 still. And then I decided to reframe it. I'm all about how we think about things, right? And so I was like, 55, oh my gosh, I'm a perfect 10. Five plus five equals 10. <laughs> Every 10 years, we get to be a perfect 10. So instead of being sad about it, embrace it. Embrace my health and how youthful I feel in the midst of midlife. So I have faced many storms in my life, and probably the most recent is Hurricane Ian. After fulfilling a 30-year dream to live on the beach, um, 11 months later, the storm hit our home where my husband and I hid out for 22 hours in our laundry room. And so a literal storm that hit our home and disrupted, maybe even devastated our dream but I think the thing about midlife is that wisdom comes, right? Like as we age as a woman, one thing I love being a middle-aged woman is how to love on other women and believe in them and pour in them. And I remember being such a young, insecure woman and now having more confidence and wanting to show other women, don't let anyone define you. Dream enormously, not even big, but enormously, and then figure out the path to get to where you want in life. And that's in your relationships, in your career, and where you physically live. And so I think there's always storms, disruptions, challenges, um, but it's how we embrace them and how we frame them that helps us get through. And one thing I've learned is that liking yourself is more valuable than anyone else liking you. And I didn't always know that. I always wanted everyone else to like me and approve of me. And when I learned to like myself and to show other women in particular how to like, how to look in the mirror and think, oh my gosh, I'm freaking beautiful. I'm amazing. I'm talented. And to see what is good in us, well, that is immensely rewarding. And that's part of my midlife realizing, as you said, there's going to be storms and highs and lows, valleys and rainbows, but um but that we have good in us through all those seasons. And so I love that you're doing this. I love that you're pouring into people to say, hey, instead of focusing on what's challenging, um, focus on what is good and how far you've come in your journey in life. And I think there is something really special that that happens to us at midlife. And for me, I had to go through my own perfect storm to get to this point. My storm started at 44 when I literally hit rock bottom. Now that I, I recently turned 50, I can look back and I, you know, I was just having a conversation with my son and he sort of said, well, you're not 60 for another 20 years. I'm like, dude, your math's a little bit off. Try 10. And he's like, well, no, that can't be. And I said, well, you know, we're talking about ages. And I said, actually, I'm really glad to be 50. I don't 
you know, we sort of look back and we look, you know, with, you know, that sort of nostalgic look on our on our younger years. But I think for many of us, when, once we take a look back and we look at it, they were kind of shitty because we didn't know who we were. We were trying to live up to all of these societal expectations. We were checking all of these boxes and we didn't learn how to be ourselves. Yes. I, uh, last night, so I have been a little bit under the weather, so sorry for my raspy, but I've been watching Suits. And in it, the woman, one of the women was walking out of the room with a zipped up back dress, little petite black dress. And I said to my husband, I remember when I used to have a dress like that. And I used to look like that. And now in talking to you, I remember not only was I fit and petite, but I was terrified. Yeah. I was so insecure. And I might've had a fit, more fit body than, or been thinner than whatever it was, but I did not love myself. I thought my value was my body. And today I know that I'm brilliant and that I'm wise and that people need my work and my wisdom and my inspiration. And all of that comes with age and learning to like yourself, but also like other women and not be threatened and not be in competition. At least for me, I've never really felt that with other women, but I have felt that need to um, be seen more than now. I feel like, you know what? I know my worth. So I hope that you value me, but if you don't, I'm still going to value me. And I think that with age, that can be a gift and that it's not always about the cute little black dress. It's more about what's inside of our brain and our body and our desire to support, collaborate and collectively lift other women up and watch them rise and pour into them and help them see themselves for their worth beyond their body. And so that that's just huge for me in my life. Yeah. And, and definitely, you know, when you said black dress, yeah, I remember a little black dress and I remember a little tiny bikini on a beach somewhere down South. And I remember wearing that bikini and feeling fat. Isn't that funny? Yeah. yeah. Yet now I'm like, I'm a curvy girl. There's more of me to love. And, and, and if you're not going to like or love me because of my curves and are you even somebody I want in my life? No. Yeah. And I think that embracing that, like one of my inspirational women is 80 years old and she just put a bikini on in front of the Eiffel Tower for her 80th birthday. And I'm like, nice. look at her just loving on herself. And she looks fantastic. But just that reminder that exactly people shouldn't love us for that. And I love that you're saying like, even when we were little petite things in our bikinis, or we didn't love ourselves. We were so hard. I'm like, you look back and you think, what the heck? What young women, I just want to say to you, like, love yourself, girl, and love yourself at all ages and stages of your body. But man, we are so hypercritical. And one of the main things I love to teach other women is be unapologetically you. And so if I listen, I'm an observer a lot. And I'll watch men bump into a woman and say, excuse me. And I'll watch women bump in and say, sorry, sorry, sorry. And I listen for how often women say sorry for who they are, for taking up space. And I'm like, what about if you're unapologetically you, especially at midlife, but at every stage, like, hey, I like myself. Excuse me is okay, but not I'm sorry. Wear your colors. Live out loud. We're talking about pineapples. Wear your pineapples. You know, be bold in who you are. Recognize your gifts. And then it is easier. Is it Lucy, right? Lucy to say, excuse me, if you don't like me, that's okay. That's okay. If you don't like me, I like me, right? With my curves, without my curves, with my brain, with my brilliance, with my big vision, with my big energy, I'm not going to apologize for being who I was created to be. And I think when you are the type of person that is out loud, I was always accused of being too loud, talking too much, being too much for people. So, you know, you do tend to sort of dim your own light, but once you can sort of get to that point and you say, heck no, I'm not going to do that. And you live that big life you've always wanted to, you still find that you're scaring people away. Yeah. Do you find that? I do. For for sure. I know I scare people. I always say, (laughs) people are like, I want to be like you. I'm like, be careful what you wish for. No, you don't. (laughs) Be careful what you wish for, because I'm kind of big and bold. But what I also think, Lucy, is that you attract the right people. The people that can handle your light, because I don't, I don't want to play small for anyone. I love that Marianne Williamson quote, our greatest fear is not what we're lacking. It's how bold we really can be. And when we let our light shine, we invite other people. And I know still to this day and forever and ever, I will be too much for some people. They are probably not my people, but there are other people that are so drawn in and that's, man, I'm so tired of being quiet. 
because I made other people uncomfortable. I'm so tired of playing small because other people didn't want me to because of their own fear, their own insecurity. But when you say, hey, I am big and bold and beautiful and brilliant, and I'm not going to be quiet. I'm going to let my light shine to shine that light on other people. I, I just think it's enormously powerful. I love being around women that I mean, truthfully, those are probably my favorite women that have been told their whole life, you need to tone down a little. Could you just like tone down? And actually that woman who did the picture in her bikini, uh, who just turned 80, I heard her speak in 2014. And she said, people told her to, you know what, you need to tone it down. Women shouldn't have boas and high heels at your age and you wear a little too much color. And she said, thank goodness I didn't listen to any of you. And that's when in that moment I went, hey, here's another powerful, impactful woman. And she has decided to not be defined by people that want to play small. And I think a lot of people that play small are really stuck inside their own insecurity. And you and I, we're not stuck. We're going to speak up and shine bright, and make noise, and we're going to help people along the way. And so we won't be everyone's cup of tea, but we will be enough people's cup of tea. And they will go, what if? What if I could authentically be myself? So I have two nicknames. One's do it, Annie, because I say I'm going to do something, then I do it. And the other is authentically Annie. And somebody once said, you are the Brene Brown of the Midwest. You show us, you don't tell us, you show us what vulnerability and authenticity looks like. And I think Lucy, when we are invited and hopefully all women, though I know it's not true at midlife, get to the point where they say, dang it, I'm so tired. I'm exhausted from living the way everyone else thinks I should live. And I've decided to live how I want to live. But I watch women go to their grave that are still so self-conscious, so insecure, so fake, pretending to be who they think they should be instead of saying, you know what, I don't like ice cream. You know what, I like doing this. I love reading this. I like to sit by myself. I like to be in the center of attention. They don't let themselves be authentic. And that is exhausting. But when you truly become, I love to wear color. I make fun of black and people are like, I like black, quit making, and I'm like, you like it because you think you look thin in it. What if you just look happy? Put some color <laughs> on. So what you know, I offend people. I don't mean to, but I'm just like, what if you're fully in color who you're meant to be? And I think Lucy, when you recognize that in ourselves, it doesn't matter if we're 40 or 50 or 60 or 75, you know, how do we embrace all of who we are? And you brought up Brene Brown and vulnerability. And I think it's important if we just take a moment, at least for myself, is that when you are living your vibrant big life, I don't think that comes with, you know, a lot of people assume that you're full of confidence all of the time and you never have limiting beliefs or you never feel, you know, a lot of these real human feelings. But we do, we, you know, for myself, you just, you feel it, but you do it anyways. Is that how, you, do you still come across limiting beliefs? Oh, of course. I mean, every day, like someone goes, how did you become the exception? I go, oh no, don't kid yourself. I wrote the book about every, I write what I need to learn and every day I have to decide, right? And every day I have to get up and fight that internal battle of my mind of what if so-and-so doesn't like you? Maybe you're not good enough. Maybe you don't fit in. Maybe you're all that doubt. But what I know is that I give power to that doubt it steals from my ability to impact other people's lives in the way that I know I was created to. And so, yes, I have it. And yes, I experience it probably every day, but I put myself out there more and more. And also we know Lucy, the more public we are, whether we're doing a podcast or on a stage, the more criticized we are. Oh, you didn't do this right. Well, I had a good friend say, you don't always do everything you teach other people. I'm like, I say that a hundred times. I am messy. I am complicated. I am teaching what I need to learn. And I'm doing the best I can every day, but do I fall short? Of course I do. And do I doubt myself? Of course I do. And when I get in my head, here's the difference. I like that question. Do I have it? Yes. If I get in my head, Lucy, and let that dictate my behavior, you know what? People aren't going to like you. You know what? You're not that smart. You know what? The, what it does is it stops me from giving my gift of wisdom to the next person. But when I think, Annie, what if you have something to teach and you speak to 6,000 people, but two people or even one person in the audience really needs what you have, put yourself out there. So I take the risk. I really do feel like it's a risk to put myself out there on social media, on podcasts, in front of rooms, knowing that I could help one person. And so I do it anyway. Exactly what you said. I have the doubt. I have the fear. And, and the truth is that the fear has a reality. Somebody won't like you. Someone will disagree with you. If you do it anyway and you help one person, if your intent is not about you, 
but about sharing that gift to help another, another woman that's sitting there in an unhealthy relationship, in an abusive career. And I help one woman go, what if, what if I left here? What if there's more to my life than where I am? Then it's worth it. It's worth the risk of being judged or falling short if I help one person every day. That's my a huge motive and driving force for me. And I believe that we all do come into this life with a purpose. Yes. And many people never get to realize their purpose. Yes. But those of us that do, we have to bravely take it out into the world because how selfish would it be yes. to keep these gifts to ourselves? So we do have to bring them out in the world. And the more that we show our own bravery and we step out, we're going to have that chain effect somebody else's it, remember the Fabergé commercial it was that yeah. shampoo commercial and she told two friends and she told two friends and she told two oh, friends okay. yeah it's, okay. it, that's that's what I believe our purpose our we come into this life with our purpose yeah and then like you said even if we're sharing it with one or two people well what effect are those one or two people going to have and then yeah. what effect are those people going to have and that's how we begin to create the change that we want to see in this world yeah a hundred percent and, and you're right, it's it's a risk and it's vulnerable, but it's so important. And if I die tomorrow, and I always think about that, like if you die, what did you leave behind? Who did you impact? And how did you taking a risk to be vulnerable, inspire and encourage one other person to be vulnerable, to push forward, to try something new, to believe in themselves? So, yeah. No, earlier you mentioned pineapples. Yes. <laughs> and you're wearing a pineapple and I have when we were talking over email, I said, yeah, funny enough, you know, I noticed your pineapple and your logo. And I said, yeah, I have all these t-shirts with pineapples on them. And you said, well, that's because you're a pineapple girl. I'm yeah. like, what is she talking about? You know, it's <laughs> like, you know, is that just my thing? What is it? And then I watched your Ted talk on pine on the pineapple story. So can you share the wisdom of the pineapple with us? Of course I uh, got called a pineapple. I didn't know what it meant. And then they taught me the cute poem, be a pineapple, stand up straight, wear a crown and be sweet on the inside. And I always love cuteness, but I also think, because I think it's fun to connect on positive and beautiful. But I always know, Lucy, that we all have a story behind our story. And sometimes even stories have a story behind them. And so I thought, what does the poem have? What story can that poem teach us to take it and give it depth? So in all people that I meet, I think there's depth to them that they may or may not share. How do I discover? And so when we think about the poem, the pineapple poem, it's about standing up. It's about wearing a crown. It's about being sweet. But if we take that poem and say there's more to it, we turn it into a principle. What we realize is when we stand up straight in a world that so many people feel invisible, unseen, unloved, undervalued, underappreciated, we stand up and we actually look people in the eye, people feel seen. And there's power in feeling seen. And that comes from standing up straight. If we wear a crown, we know our value. And when we know our value, whether we feel like it or not, we treat our bodies different. We take better care of ourselves. We do more positive things. But if I wear a crown because I'm valuable, then I look around and I realize everyone I meet, every single person in every encounter on the street and in a corporation and in a stadium has value. And when we have value, we treat ourselves better. So when I don't know that I'm valuable, I might eat junk food all day, lay around, have negative self-talk, have negative talk about other people. But when I know I'm valuable, I get out of bed, I go for a walk, I drink a glass of water, I speak kind words about myself and about you and everyone around me. And when we're sweet on the inside, what comes through our mouth and our keyboard and our text message is kindness, encouragement, and love. And in a world that is so hurting, I think that if I started a movement and as it continues to grow and turned everybody into pineapple people, people would see each other, they would value and they would be sweet. And I literally think one little piece of fruit could change the whole world if we followed the example of the pineapple poem, which I turned into a pineapple principle. Yeah, and I, I love the pineapple poem. I hadn't heard it before, but it also made me think about the, call it prickly skin on the outside of the pineapple. Yeah. And I think that, you know, and the sweetness that is inside every pineapple. And I think that's sort of an important way to look at other people that potentially their prickly outside is their armor because they have that sweetness inside and they're trying to protect it. But it's the life that's happened to them is yeah. they're standing firmly in that outer shell because they're so afraid of getting that the inner sweetness hurt. 
Yes. And a lot of people will say that to me. What about the prickly, Annie? And I say, you ever been prickly? I'm like, we're all prickly sometimes, but that doesn't mean that's who we are. It means it is our coat that we wear to protect ourselves because of fear, because we don't want to be vulnerable, because we're afraid we're not enough. And so we start to lash out at other people, but that's all about our own insecurity, our own woundedness that has not been healed. But as we learn to heal and become and believe in ourselves, well, then we can you know, take that, take the coat off and just let the, sh the sweetness shine and show. And I think midlife's interesting too, as we think, Lucy, like my mother's 95, my mother-in-law's 93, my father-in-law passed away at 96. And I was just with this doctor at the conference saying people in this generation will live to 120. So you're not even at midlife yet. <laughs> and they said the next generation will be 140. So people at 70 will be at midlife. Like it is which used to be the extent of life, 40 and 50 even. But isn't it amazing? Like people are just, I don't know. Well, you know, there's somebody pointed out to me that theoretically we are the third generation to be going through menopause because of our life expectancy and how that's changed over the years. Mm. So, you know, that, that, that speaks to that midlife on how, the midlife needle keeps moving further and further down the road. And a lot of women will sit there at 50, 55 and say, well, I'm too old for that. I'm too old to try something new. I'm too old to follow my dreams. Mm -hmm. And, you know, going to your point of chances are we're going to live to be a hundred that you've got 50 more years. Yes. What are you going to do? Yeah. Write that book, write that book. You've been talking about for years and years, but make sure that book isn't just about you. It's about the lessons that you can use to teach other people on their journey. That's what I always, I'm just finishing my eighth book. And I always think when I write, yes, I have a story that inspires the writing, but I want to take that and say, now, how do you apply it? Like, how do you take that tool? And you're right. People are living longer. That's fascinating to think about. We're only the third generation to go through menopause. Like, I'm like, I got to chew on that one for a I was going to say, like, at least in what I would call recent history. I mean, when we go yeah. back to ancient civilizations, that's a whole other, you know, kettle of wisdom that we're dealing with there. But really, if you look in the last generations, I think, you know, my my grandmother, um, she would have been really sort of that first one that was really pushing past that sort of 50 age group. Yeah. And I was, I wonder, I mean, this is a little deep, but like, I'm thinking about menopause. Was it happening in their thirties? You know, was it much earlier because girls were getting married and having babies at 12 and 13 and then maybe menopause was, I don't know. I'm just, I think they, no, I think they, because, you know, in those times women were having 10, 12, 14 babies. They were, they were having babies right up until their body said no more. And then, and there's also been sort of a lot of research that the reason why women may not have experienced menopause in the same way is because they went right from having kids to taking care of grandkids because we had those communal families. So you always, that sense of purpose was always woven into your life huh. where, you know, so much of what we're doing now, you know, people do face that lack of purpose or if they have their purpose, they're not sure how to live it. Yeah. And that's why we're falling into this epidemic of depression and uncertainty is because people, they don't know how to live authentically and they're not connecting with their purpose and they're lost. And even given the time to discover like, which is a fascinating thing is that women do have a lot more choices today than they used to, right? Like it wasn't, you're not just created to procreate and procreate and procreate until your body falls apart. Like you have a choice and you can have careers and you can travel and you can have a leap year and you can go to college or not go to college or go to a trade school. Like there's just so many doors have been opened, right? And that's a good thing. Um, but people finding their purpose beyond being a body that can produce another body, right? Like yeah. That, can have a career and you can have a thought and that women are brilliant and women can write and teach and explore and invent. And I just think, I don't know, it's just fascinating just thinking about how far we have come in many ways that when I meet young girls, they don't just think I've got to have them be a mom or get married. Some of them are like, I don't want to get married or I want to wait a while or I want a career. And I just think it's kind of, it's fascinating to me. It's interesting. And I like seeing young women 
feel so empowered to think about, nope, I'm going to be an engineer and this is what I'm going to do, or I'm going to travel the world and they're not afraid. It's very powerful um, to watch the younger generation. I have a daughter that's turning 29 on Saturday, um, you know, and just kind of cool to watch how, her different careers and she's a recruiter and what she has explored doing and travel. And I don't know. I mean, I guess I wasn't that same 20 year old. Um, that's that not how was. we were raised. Yeah. We, I certainly, I was raised by stay-at-home mom. The yeah. prospect of me wanting a career was so foreign to her. She didn't even know how to speak to me about it. She never knew how to speak to me on post-secondary education mm. because it just, to her, it's, well, why don't you just want to be a mom and stay at home and have kids? I'm like, get a well, man. <laughs> we were raised in the eighties. We were told that we can <laughs> have our careers and, you know, and that came with its own load of luggage in itself, but we can have careers and we can have families yeah. and, you know, that set us on a different path. And we really have been the trailblazers for the women today is we are the ones that you know we went through the trying to be that sort of perfect have a career and and be the perfect mom and now we're going okay wait a second that doesn't work yeah, <laughs> that's, that's exhausting, exhausting and i'm I, tired I, I'm very exhausting <laughs> i'm I tired I, I went to therapy and i was like she's like what's going on I'm like i'm trying to be a perfect mom and not everything is working out like i thought if i gave my kids what i didn't have they'd be she's like yeah oh no, yeah it doesn't, doesn't work, work. and i was like dang it <laughs> dang it so been oh there God. been there yes. oh my gosh yes you know so and and a lot of what we went through like we were taught by the sitcoms we watched where there were those perfect working mothers yeah you know so there was there was a lot that shaped us and I think that's part of the you know sort of the gen x midlife woman today is we're like wait a second <laughs> That wasn't right. We're we're <laughs> calling we're calling all of this stuff out. We're like, no, this doesn't work. And we have two sons. They're they're 21 and 24, and they're both with, you know, their their life partners. And we've said to them, like, get married, don't get married. That's yeah. up to you. That's your choice. Have kids, don't have kids. The one thing that we've said is your 20s, your 20s of your time to throw as much shit at the wall and see what you like and see what sticks. And then in your 30s, then start to sort of move into some of these bigger decisions. I got married at 21. Okay. I had my first my first at, you know, 25 going on 26. I look at my 24-year-old now and I'm like, there's no way. There's no way. And I think, what was I thinking? Where are we thinking? <laughs> it's kind of true. Like you do, our oldest just turned 35 last week. And I had my first when I was 20. So I was very young. And I look at him and I'm like, I had a 15 year old in this. Like, what in the world? Like, how did I do that? But I think you just do what you have to do when you go through it. And um, yeah, we man. were too young. We were too young to know any different. But then again, I look at it and I'm like, I could not have little kids. Yeah, my I have a sister who's two years older. Um, I think her youngest is. 11 12 wow and I'm like oh no <laughs> I think you just do it at whatever age my <laughs> you mom was 40 when she had yeah. me I was 20 when I had my baby and I'm like you just do whatever you have to do in that thing but you do look back and like even talking to you I'm like I can't believe I really am when you're talking about in your 30s I'm like yep that's about right I'm about in my 30s no I'm not I'm 55 I think I'm in such denial of it I was just always feel so young in my mind um but yeah, I mean, every stage is fascinating and interesting. And I was a little bit older when I got married. None of our kids are married and they're 25 to 35, three kids. And I think, oh my gosh, how did I do that? And they are not ready. But then other days I think, I don't know, we're just all on a journey and you just do what you need to do when you do it. And I'm just grateful for every day. And I have a number of friends that are grandparents and I'm like, I'm not ready for that. And then no. I'm like, but if I was, I told my husband's mad at me because he's like, you scared our kids from having kids. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't scare them. I just told the truth. They are expensive and they are a lot of work. And that's just the truth. You know, it's not like I'm trying to terrify. It's a reality. And I think if you don't know that it's easy to think it's going to be easy and someone's just going to love you. And that's not really their work, right? Kids are a lot of work. I love being a mom. It's the best, but I'm grateful. Um, that they are where they are in their stage as well. So no rush. No rush. And and I've in a lot of ways when I look back, I realize that 
you know, we were young when we had our kids and there was a certain amount of growing up that we had to do along with our kids because we hadn't done it yet. We hadn't lived. We hadn't, we were still kids ourselves. So we had to, we had to do a lot of growing up on the run. <laughs> That's right. I remember my oldest saying, I'm like a guinea pig to you. I'm like, you kind of are. Yes, I yes. think every kid is, you know, we don't know our first time around you're doing the best you can, but we don't I know. Just, I so. just tell them, just let your therapist know. I'm sorry. I did my best. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I did the best I could. I now, know. as we wrap up today, Annie, I'm just wondering if you have any final words of wisdom to share with our listeners. My big thing I mean, I have so many, but two big thoughts that I like to leave. Um, I'm guessing most of the listeners are female. They may be men out there too, which is great. But two things is to be unapologetically you. And what I mean by that is fully embrace your quiet, your bold, your talkative, your silent self, and don't apologize. Don't apologize for taking up space, for being who you were created to be with your gifts. And the other thing that if I could encourage every person in the world to every day look in the mirror and think, oh my gosh, I am so good looking. I get to be me today. How lucky am I? Because I hear way too often that people look in the mirror and they see what's wrong with them, what's lacking. And they spend the whole day playing that tape of, I wish I was like her. I wish I looked like him. I wish I made that money. Instead of being like, I am freaking amazing. And the, I'm giving myself to the world today as a gift, my brilliance, my wisdom, my kindness, my smile. And uh, that's what I want. I want to encourage you to be unapologetically you, to look in the mirror and be grateful for all your beauty and gifts and to do your best to not compare yourself to other people because that steals our joy. So, Annie, I can sincerely feel the love that you put out in the world. It's it's much appreciated. It's, it's what we need. It's what we definitely need. And my role for the roller coaster is to empower women like you to thrive in this amazing chapter of our lives. So go on, embrace the adventure and start rocking midlife like the badass that you are. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe and leave a review and share it with a friend because our greatest power is in community. And don't forget to visit my website, therollercoasterpodcast.com and click on start here. And this is where you'll get your free audio course, three steps to go from hot mess to badass and start rocking midlife. I'd like to thank you, my listeners, for choosing to join us today. And Annie, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great day. And until next time, keep riding the roller coaster and embracing the adventure of midlife.